And this is Tactical Arms. On this episode of Tactical Arms, we're going to take a look at 30 caliber lightweight belt-fed machine guns. Now back in the day, that would have been the M60E3 or the M60E4, but today, that means the FN Mark 48. That's the first up on our list. Let's check it out on the range. This is the FN Mark 48 7.62 millimeter belt fed machine gun, the death dealer of naval special warfare. To quote Mark Lasky, it just keeps shooting and the enemy just keeps dying. The Mark 48 is based on the Mark 46, which in and of itself is a lightweight adaptation of the M249 saw chambered in 5.56 NATO. The Navy SEALs had fielded a number of lightweight machine guns based on the USM-60 design over the years, and they decided after seeing the success of the Mark 46, they wanted a 30 caliber bigger brother. And this is what they got. The Mark 48 weighs 18 and a quarter pounds, approximately 20% lighter than the FN manufactured M240, which is their 7.62 general purpose machine gun. It also has a length of around 39 inches, an 18 inch quick detached barrel, fired from an open bolt, full auto only, at around 730 rounds per minute. The Mark 48 features Picatinny rails on the top cover and in the forearm area. And although initially fielded with the Navy SEALs, the weapon has been used across the full spectrum in special operations today. I'm a big believer in giving credit where credit's due. And in my opinion, FN is the undisputed world leader in belt-fed machine guns. Here to talk to us about some of the key features in the Mark 48 is Clint Lynch from FN Manufacturing in Columbia, South Carolina. Clint, if you would, give us a brief overview on how FN made this gun such a lightweight 7.62 machine gun. Sure thing. We wanted to reduce as much weight as possible without sacrificing the integrity in a lot of the, the components themselves, or certainly the receiver. So the engineering team reduced weight by adding lightning holes or lightning slots wherever possible. The profile of the barrel, uh, a lot of weight reduced there without giving up any performance and as well as the bipod itself, which is primarily built from titanium. Unlike the M240, the general purpose machine gun, bigger brother, so to speak, this is a stamp sheet metal gun, is that correct? That's right. The receiver itself starts as a stamped steel channel, and then other machine parts are welded to it, and then further machining is done uh, prior to finish. I also notice a lot of aluminum is used where necessary to reduce weight, but also where it has adequate strength. That's right, the top cover uh, in particular, as well as the modular rail handguard system. And also the housing for the fire control system is aluminum. Talk us through the heat shield and what that's all about. Well, the original Mod Zero version of this weapon system featured an over-the-top, or what we used to call the doghouse-style modular handguard. And what we found, actually, from operator feedback was that the excess heat coming off the barrels were actually cooking those modular lasers and lights that they were adding to the system. And also, it just wasn't feasible to have a barrel that, that couldn't be handled uh, after removal. We were asked to give the barrel chain handle uh, back on the weapon, and uh, we used the, uh, the heat shield from the, the M249 uh, to fit on the gun itself. A couple other things I saw under the feed tray cover here is this reinforcement plate, which I know is relatively new. That caught my eye immediately. And the other are these additional feed paws for positioning, a critical piece of kit. It makes a big difference. It allows the individual who's operating this weapon system to load by himself. He doesn't need an assistant gunner to reload. He can also reload a belt without the benefit of needing a starter tab or something like that. The reinforcement plate does a couple things. It helps to strengthen not only the top cover, but the receiver from the torsion or the twisting that occurs when this bolt reciprocates back and forth with a lot of energy. And the other thing I need to clarify here, a weapon like this in special operations, like in the SEALs, is generally run by one guy. Unlike in a regular infantry unit with an M240, they have a machine gun crew or assistant gunner. Exactly, so if he's starting with a partial belt of ammo or a belt that doesn't have a starter tab, he can lay the linked ammo across this feed tray 
without having to worry about the ammo slipping off the tray. Real good design feature. And to give FN a little bit of love here, this is the kind of stuff I'm talking about when I see FN's product. One last question, Clint. I own a lot of FN weapons and studied a lot of designs. And I know FN loves adjustable gas regulators. Talk me through why this has a fixed gas system. Well, one nice thing about a military customer, Larry, is they usually know what types of ammo they're going to be using up front. We were able to simplify the gas system of the design and ultimately lead to something that's very reliable and easier to clean than having a multiple part adjustable regulator like on the old M249 style. All the new weapons being delivered from FN have a what we call monoblock gas block, which uh, is also non-adjustable. Well, I want to thank you for coming with this gun, and I definitely enjoy lighting this thing up on the range. As cool as the Mark 48 is, the Russians have fielded a lightweight 30 caliber general purpose machine gun in the PKM since the 1960s. Serious students of small arms will tell you this is a very reliable and effective belt-fed machine gun. Our troops face it on a daily basis in Iraq and Afghanistan, and to find out more about it, you got to get behind the trigger. Let's head out to the range. This is the PKM. Originally designed in the Soviet Union by Mikhail Kalashnikov and his design team, it was introduced in 1965 and it fires 7.62 by 54R, Russian rimmed 30 caliber round. PKM is largely manufactured from stamp sheet metal. In 1965, nearly four decades ago, the Soviets fielded a lightweight general purpose machine gun a weapon that the United States has just brought into service within the last decade in the Mark 48. This weapon weighs about 20 pounds, including the bipod, and has a 25 inch barrel. Okay, if you're watching from home and you're looking at this, you're probably thinking double feed time, right? Because this weapon fires from a rimmed cartridge, it has to pull the case out of the belt, position it down in front of the bolt before it pushes into the chamber to fire. Now Kalashnikov cracked this nut in a real simple and ingenious way. He has a claw on top of the bolt carrier that grabs the next case. As it pulls to the rear, a spring-loaded positioner in the feed tray cover pushes it down and in line with the chamber for the bolt to strip it and fire it. Real simple, kicks ass. The PKM fires from a non-disintegrating link belt. And this particular salt box has 100 rounds in it, which means it has two 50 round belts linked together. Now this one will fall away after 51 rounds are fired, but it's a snag hazard prior to that in case you have to pick up and maneuver. And it's also interesting to note that most ambushes in Afghanistan last as long as it takes to fire a 50 round belt out of a PKM. In addition, it's really a left-hander gun, meaning it feeds from the right and ejects left. And the safety is on the left-hand side of the gun where a right-handed shooter would manipulate it with his thumb, a left-handed shooter would manipulate it with his trigger finger. Overall, it's a real left-hander friendly gun, so shooters like me, dig it. The sights are both windage and elevation adjustable in the rear, and what's interesting to note is, is this is exactly the same sight picture that the Russian or Soviet soldier has been looking at since the late 1800s with the Mosin Dot rifle. However, one notable difference in the PKM, the rear sight is flipped around backwards. The PKM has a reputation of being extremely robust and reliable, and one thing that helps with that is the fact that all the openings to the receiver are spring-loaded, which means there's spring-loaded doors that keep the feed tray cover and the ejection port closed, except only when it has to be open. One of the most interesting things about the PKM is the three-position gas regulator. It's located right up here towards the front of the gun. Now, what's really cool about it is when the gun gets too hot to handle, you can take a rim of a 7.62 by 54R cartridge case, put it in the T-slot at the bottom, and adjust it as necessary. Absolutely ingenious. 
And make no mistake, the PKM can definitely stand a facelift. There's no good way to mount optics. The folded bipod acts as a very poor forearm, and the bipod legs themselves are a little bit too long for my taste. But from an engineering and design point of view, in many ways, this is Kalashnikov's best weapon. Okay, my buddy Monty and I have got a little demonstration for you here. Mark 48, Scar Heavy SSR on T12 on US Training Center. Now, here's what we're looking to do. Show you the difference between suppressive fire and precision fire with the two most common 7.62 weapons on the battlefield today. The belt-fed machine gun and the sniper rifle. Monty, what's your take on suppressive fire versus precision fire with belt fed or sniper rifle? Well, I definitely think there's a place for both of them. I'd say with the 7.62 belt fed weapon with larger forces with a high volume of fire, it allows you to put fire down there to keep the enemy's head down. It's gonna allow you to bring our guys back up to put effective fire on the enemy as well as uh, allow yourself to get some movement and to get out of the area. Another interesting twist that is often overlooked is the fact that obviously with a belt fed weapon, you got a lot more rounds before you have to reload, but the reload process takes longer with this weapon than it does with that. It does. This thing definitely has its own little niche. You go through the rounds a lot quicker, but the catch is, is you're putting rounds on target hopefully every time, so you're having a harder effect on the enemy. Roger that. Well, you and I both agree that sometimes the lines between these two guns are a little bit blurred, but that has its role and this has its role. For instance, vehicle mounted, then you can detach, get down on the ground, use it off the bipod as a ground mounted machine gun. Really not applicable to a sniper rifle, but far more precise shots can be taken with that than with this. Okay, we figure the best way to show you this is we have steel down range. We're gonna fire from this position, the Mark 48 and the SSR. Monty's gonna be shooting the sniper rifle, I'll be shooting the belt fed. We have individual steel targets and even a grouping of targets. We're gonna attempt to engage all of them and see which weapon has the greatest effect on that given target. Okay, obviously today on this course of fire against these steel targets, the SSR reigns supreme. Doesn't mean there's not a place for the Mark 48, but out here today, that's the big dog. Monty, why don't you uh, put on a little show for the folks at home and see if you can clean those six plates and the inside of the range down there. Punch through the wall and knock him down. Going hot.
Okay, we're about ready to have a little side-by-side -side comparison. Mark 48 versus PKM. A series of tests. I'll explain each one before we do it. We're out here on T10 U.S. Training Center. Now, this is unscientific, so save the hate mail. But I promise you this, it's going to look kick-ass on TV. Okay, our first test is our accuracy test. We're looking for group dispersion downrange. Ten round burst with both weapons on an MGM steel full silhouette target. And we'll go down and count the number of hits we got out of that ten round burst. PKM is up to bat first. Yeah, baby. Yeah. All right, let's do a little CSI tactical arms. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. I'm gonna go ahead and say we got all 10 on target. That 10th minute it went through, we won't know for sure until we review the tape. Let me tell you something, that was way cool from where I was at. I'm sure at home that looked good. If you didn't think that was cool, feel free to go ahead and change the TV to the badminton channel. Now, it's time for the Mark 48, baby. Bring it on. Okay, next is the Mark 48. Now, I'm gonna shoot this left-handed, even though that's not recommended. I'm left eye dominant. I see the front sight clear with my left eye. I'm gonna tuck my right arm up underneath the buttstock so as to avoid getting hit by the ejected grass. See how it goes. All right, time to check it out. Oh yeah, baby. Okay, let's see if we can count the number of hits we got. One, two, three, four, five, six. I don't know if I lost some off, but it rocked back and then fell forward. Neutral observers on site felt that the group might have even been tighter. It's probably gonna have to be a draw between the two guns. The fact the target's falling down adds a little bit of a wild card into this. Regardless, I would not wanna be at 100 meters catching a 10 round burst from either the PKM or Mark 48, bad day. Okay, now we have a little reload drill. I'm gonna run a four round burst out of the PKM and then I'm gonna reload the weapon using the starter tab as it's designed to be reloaded. Get it back in action. We'll get a time on that. Then I'm gonna do the same thing with the Mark 48, running the way a special operations single operator would run it without a starter tab. We'll see how it goes. faster than a PKM. Of course, I'm more used to the loading setup of a gun like this. Okay, next comparison between the Mark 48 and the PKM. We have a short cinder block, loosely stacked wall. Four high, two deep. We got a pepper popper, which is simulating an enemy soldier on the knee hiding behind the cinder block wall. I'm gonna see how few shots I can fire and punch through the wall and knock him down. Going hot. Up here, that looked pretty cool. But you gotta check the hits. Okay, 14 shots out of the PKM 762 by 54R to eat through our little cinder block wall here. Now we're gonna take this pepper popper, put it over there, try the same stunt with a Mark 48. Stand by. Looking good, baby. Okay, essentially exactly the same result with the Mark 48. 14 rounds to penetrate the center blocks, knock down the Taliban pepper popper. Now, no surprise in the result, they're both 30 caliber, full-size rifle cartridge. 762 by 54R for PKM, 7.62 NATO for Mark 48. Last test we got for you, little burst accuracy test on the three swingers. Total of 12 rounds. My intent is to put a four round burst in the vicinity of each target. We'll see how the hits go. Oh, 
okay, I was a little high on the middle target. That was on me. Got good bursts on the first one and the last one. Remember, those targets have a tendency to turn and twist, much like the enemy does when bullets are going through them. Overall, though, I'll take the hits down range. Not bad with the PKM. Let's try it with the Mark 48. Okay, overall not bad. When I switched to my left shoulder, because I'm left eye dominant, got a much better sight picture and better hits. Overall, accuracy is probably about the same. The miss I had with the PKM, I'll put on me, but uh, burst dispersion with both weapons is about the same. I would not want to be downrange from either one of these guns. I must admit, I had a blast filming this particular episode. I got some trigger time behind the Mark 48, a gun I did not have a lot of time on and really grew to like. And I reacquainted myself to the classic PKM, a gun that I've had an appreciation for for years. What's not to like? Two belt fed 30 cals? What more can I say? See you next time, right back here, Tactical Arms.